As we are here together in this special time of prayer, I think it's very appropriate for us to begin this meeting with a prayer. So those of you who can kneel together with us, we invite you to kneel at this time for prayer. Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you that you have given us this privilege to meet together in prayer. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit in this meeting. We think of the needs that we have as a church, as a people during this time of crisis. We think of those who have passed away as a result of this epidemic. We think of their families. We ask you to be with them in a special way to give them comfort and peace. We ask you to be with us as a church that we may maintain our focus on the things that we need to see so that we as a people can prepare for your soon coming. Bless us once again as we open your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. We have called a special week of prayer during this month of August, and we have come to the very last part of our week of prayer meetings. Why is it that we have called a special week of prayer? Why is it that we felt so urgent that we need this special time a week of prayer? Well, the reason being is because the times in which we are living in are special. We are living in a special time. Businesses have been closed during this time. Some businesses are never going to reopen again. The economic forecast for the future is dismal. All of this affects us as a church. When we think about evangelism, when we think about foreign missions, all of that is interrelated with finance. And so it's affecting us as a church to a great degree. You know, when we look at the relationship of the individual to governments, the dependence upon governments today is greater than ever before in the history of many nations. And it reminds me of the history of the Roman Empire and the downfall of the Roman Empire when people began to depend upon governments for their sustenance. What happened? It demoralized the entire Roman Empire and it came crashing down. And we're looking at repeating history. You know, it doesn't matter what type of governments we have been living under doesn't matter whether it's conservative, liberal, dictatorship or not. All of them have fallen in line with this same type of thinking. And now we go to the debate on vaccinations has been revived. In recently in Australia on um, July 23rd, 2020, the Nine News had a had a headline there stating that uh, the Prime Minister says no travel without vaccine. Now that's a serious matter for all of us to consider that vaccinations, this whole issue of vaccinations is coming to the forefront. I know medical opinion is divided in regards to vaccine, but why is it that this is now being a requirement and it's getting more and more in society. It reminds me of when my father was talking to me about living in communism and how one of the things that were urgent in communism was vaccinations. Why is that? Now, I'm not subscribing to all of this fear-mongering and everything else. But you know, the other day I did hear a statement before the CIA from one of the leaders in the tech industry saying that they are developing some type of vaccine to be able to change the way people think, especially on relig religious radicals. 
And I know they're talking about some of the radicals that have been blowing up people and everything else, but what is it that determines religious radicalism? Is that something that's going to be reintroduced in order to change the way we are thinking? Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. I do know one thing, that the spirit of prophecy tells us that it's going to be a lot worse than we can ever imagine. There's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that we don't know, but we do know one thing, that the devil does want to control people. And all of these things that are happening in society we can see slowly is leading to the control of the human mind. And when we look at what's been happening with churches, churches are being closed down. In some places you cannot even meet with two people to meet together. It reminds me of what happened during the time of the Civil War. You know, in 1865, the Civil war in the United States had been going on already for almost four long years. It seemed that there was no end in sight. And what has happened was that evangelism had finally come to a halt. Yes, a lot of things about evangelism are being affected today by this whole thing, just like it was during the time of war. And so when that was happening, what did God's people do? There was only one thing to do during that time. It did not matter on which side or what was happening or whether there was conspiracies going on or not. It did not matter. The fact was that it was affecting the evangelistic outreach of the church. And so, what could they do? There is only one thing that the people of God can do, and that is to turn to God in prayer. God can still overrule things. You know, in Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, it states there that I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Yes, there was a work of sealing that needed to take place, and that sealing could not go on with that war continuing, and something had to give, and God's people turned to prayer. In early writings on page 38, it says, I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I heard and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers and that he gave his angels charge over things on the earth. That the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds and that they were about to let them go. But while their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed. Yes, there was a remnant, and this remnant was not sealed. And how can you go on with the work if the remnant was not sealed? And then it continues on. And he raised his hands to the Father and pleaded with him that he has spilled his blood for them. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to the four angels and bid them hold until the servants of God were sealed with the seal of the living God in their forehead. Yes, that's what they had to do. They had to hold the four angels, hold the winds that were about to blow, and then, after they were being held, then the work can go on again. The first special day of fasting and prayer was set for February 11th, 1865. 
And then they set aside another time, March 1 through 4, that that was going to be a special time of prayer. And they met every day, and they prayed together. And that was their very first week of prayer. That was on March 1 through 4 of 1865. And as I mentioned earlier, it seemed that nothing was going to stop the war. People were pretty well determined. But miraculously, on April 9th, 1865, General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. And on April 26th, Johnson surrendered in Durham, North Carolina, and the war was over. Once again, we were free to do evangelism. You know, when we look at what's happening in the world today, we've had many different types of opportunities to work for the Lord. But you know, there is a special work that we need to remember needs to go forward. During times of communism and severe persecution of the church, this work was continued. In the early Christian church, when the dragon was wroth with the church, it work continued. We find this in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Yes, house to house work is something that is imperative in the work of the Christian church. And why is it so important? Why is it so important that we do house to house ministry, visiting in people's homes? You know, just this week, I had a chance to visit several homes. This is actually the last couple of weeks. I've been visiting in some of the homes of the believers, talking to some of the young people who are giving their heart to the Lord, preparing for baptism, and some desiring for baptism. That personal labor cannot be replicated in any other way. We find in Gospel Workers, page 188, to my ministering brethren, I would say, by personal labor, reach the people where they are. Become acquainted with them. The work, this work cannot be done by proxy. Money loaned or given cannot accomplish it. Sermons from the pulpit cannot do it teaching the scriptures in families. This is the work of an evangelist. And this work is to be united with preaching. If it is omitted, the preaching will be, to a great extent, a failure. Yes, during this time of COVID, I thank the Lord that we did have a strong internet ministry. I thank the Lord for those who are working behind the scenes, those who you don't see. In order to do this recording, there's a lot of work that has to go on behind the scenes. And we need to pray during this time for those who are volunteering their time, those who are spending their time to get these recordings out to the people onto the internet to be able to reach people where they are. We can thank the Lord for that. And you know, we have here on the screen, here we have some of the things that we were doing behind the scenes. This particular one was teaching a missionary school where I was not able to go there in person, and yet we can use it there and reach together and communicate with the people. But that's not enough. That's not the only work that we need to be doing. We still need to go into people's homes. Why is it? Why do we need to go to people's homes? We read there earlier in Gospel Workers that that is how we become familiar with people. 
We become there and we become understanding of their circumstances and their situations in life. And that's what we need. And why is it that we need to be so eager to be in their homes to combine the pulpit ministry, whether it's in person in church or like we're doing right now through the uh, presentations that we are giving? It needs to be combined with house-to-house labor, meeting with people, studying with them, answering their questions in a personal way. Why is it? Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When is the end going to come? When this gospel is preached into all the world. And then what happens when the gospel is preached into all the world? We look at Matthew 24 and verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Why is it that we need to preach the gospel into all the world? Because then Jesus will come. Do you want to see Jesus? I know I want to see Jesus. I want to spend time with Jesus. And that means we need to finish this work. That means we need to have freedom to be able to travel places. We need to have freedom to go into people's homes and visit them personally so that we can see Jesus coming again the second time. And what will happen when Jesus comes the second time? What will be ushered into this universe? We find this in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. You see, God has a better place for us. God is preparing a better place. And when you and I think about that better place, what's going to happen when you and I think of that better place? What will happen to us? You know, Jesus told his disciples just before the crucifixion, just before it was going to get the worst events that are going to happen in their lifetime, and we can look at prophecy and we can see that what we have experienced today is nothing comparison to what is going to happen. All these conspiracy theories, they don't even know what they're talking about. It's going to be worse than all of that. And what does Jesus say to his people? What does Jesus say to his church? What does he say to you and me today? The same thing he told the disciples just before the crucifixion in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. He says what? Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You see, let not your hearts be troubled, no matter what's happening around us. No matter what you hear, no matter what restrictions we are going under, let not your hearts be troubled. Why? Because there is a better place. Jesus is preparing that better place for you and for me. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, it says, Therefore, behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. I want you to think about what happens when Jesus comes again the second time and takes us to this new heaven and a new earth. 
It says there that we are not even going to remember where we came from. It's not even going to come into mind. Why? Because we are living in such a wonderful place. Do you want to be in such a wonderful place? And that's why it's so important for us during this time, during this week of prayer as we're praying for God to allow us to be able to present the gospel to the world in freedom. In order to do, why are we doing that? We need to be thinking about that better place. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 19 tells us about that better place. And what is that better place? What makes it so good that we don't even remember the former things? What is it? It says, And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Notice this. In that place, there is no more weeping. You're not going to hear people crying. And right now, as you hear of different people dying, a lot of people have died from COVID-19. A lot of people have died from other diseases that they were going to die with anyways. But they still died. And what does it mean? Whether they die of COVID-19, whether they die of a car crash, whether they die of a whatever it may be, whatever it is, it's a sad event because God never designed us to die. He did not want us to die. He wanted us to live forever. But when we go to that other world, there is no more dying. There is no more weeping. There is none of that anymore. And what is God going to do? Revelation 21, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Yes, God is going to wipe away all tears from our eyes because there is no more death. Yeah, we can live 70 years. Some people think 70 years is a long time. I used to think 70 years was a long time. But now as I'm getting closer to that, each uh, you know, decade I'm getting a bit closer and closer. And you know, it's not very comfortable knowing that you're going to die soon. Why? Because God never designed us to die. Whether you live 70, 80, 90, 100, it is too young to die. But we're living in this mortal world. And what does God want us to do? He wants us to prepare for another place, a better place where God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And what's going to be in that better place? Isaiah 65, verse 21 and 22. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Yes, we're going to be able to build a house and actually inhabit that house. You know, my entire adult life, it seems that I was building one house, and as soon as it's completed, I move to another place and start another house, either remodeling or building. And then planting things. You know, you want to plant an orchard. I just was living there in Australia. We had a nice orchard there. We had all our... Uh, the, uh, all our fruits there, especially the citrus, we had uh, red grapefruit, we had uh, lemons and oranges and even lemonade lemons, okay? And they were coming out there and we're just getting ready to start harvesting them like normal and then it's time to move again. But here it says we're going to be able to plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them, build a house and actually stay in that house. Yeah, all the hard work that you do, and you're going to actually stay in that house. That's what God is preparing for us. 
And that's what we should be thinking about as we close this week of prayer, as we close this time that we are praying that God's merciful hand will do something with this virus, with the things that are, people are thinking about and everything else, to be able to give us freedom to go and evangelize the world. Yes, we have abused the time before. We have not done what we should have done. That is true, but that was a wake-up call for all of us to understand what God has planned for us. And then what about the animal world? What is it going to be like with the animals? You know, I love animals. You know, I love all sorts of animals. You know, even when I see some of those dangerous animals, I had the privilege of going to Africa and petting the lion and wait, walk, taking a lion for a walk and cuddling with a cheetah. I love that. Even snakes, you know, I love it. Some years ago, I was down in Florida, and there was this, uh, I think it was like about an 18-foot snake, and uh, the owner let me go inside the cage with him and actually go and play with the snake a little bit. I mean, I love all sorts of animals, but you know, unless they are tamed, you can't do that to them. Sometimes I see animals in the wild, and I wish I can go pat them, but you can't. They look at you, and they either run away, or they're going to be frozen for you. But what about the promises that we have in Isaiah 65 and verse 25? It says, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and thus shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. And then also in um, Isaiah Chapter 11, verses 6 to 8. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play in the hole of the asp, and the winged child shall put his hand in the cockatrice's den. Can you imagine for a moment what a wonderful place that God is preparing for us? Yes, God is preparing this place. And today, when we're having these difficult times, and some people have been locked in for a long period of time, and especially if you're living in an apartment or something of that nature, I pity those type of people. They're closed in in that environment. I thank the Lord that I live outside the city. I thank the Lord that I live in a place that I have a bit of land where I can go out and enjoy the land. And that's why God has told His people long time ago to move out out of the cities, to get out of these places. And this should be a wake-up call to all of us. Even if you're living in a comfortable house in the city, move out because this is what's, it's going to get worse. And God wants His people to be in nature. But no matter where we are, when we're locked up, it's not very easy for any of us. But you know, we can think of the better land. We can think of what God has prepared for those that love him. In early writings, it discusses a little bit about what it's going to be like when it's all purified. On page 295, it says there, I then looked and saw the fire which had consumed the wicked, burning up the rubbish and purifying the earth. Again, I looked and saw the earth purified. There was not a single sign of the curse. Can you imagine that? Not a single sign of the curse in the world. God is preparing a place that all the curses will be removed. And then it continues on. It says, The broken, uneven surface of the earth now looked like a level, extensive plain. God's entire universe was clean, and the great controversy was forever ended. Wherever we looked, everything upon which the eye rested was beautiful and holy. And all the redeemed host, old and young, great and small, cast their glittering crowns at the feet of their Redeemer and prostrated themselves in adoration before Him and worshipped Him that liveth forever and ever. The beautiful new earth 
with all its glory, was the eternal inheritance of the saints. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven was then given to the saints of the Most High who were to possess it forever and even forever and ever. Yes, God has prepared a place for us. Can you imagine living in that place? And this is the time that we are, as we are looking at all of these things that are happening in the world today, we need to be thinking of the better place. And is that better place a real possibility? We read in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What is it that makes this heaven and this earth such a beautiful place? What is it that makes it such a better place than where we're living in? It's the knowledge of the glory of God. The knowledge of God makes it that better place. In the world in which we are living in today, people are trying to run away from the knowledge of God. And this knowledge of God makes it a better place. And this is why it's so imperative upon us, uh, imperative upon you and me, that we start evangelizing the world. Why? Because this world, even in the condition it's in, will be a better place if they have the knowledge of God. And we have this knowledge. It's in our hands. What are we doing with this knowledge that God has given to us? And why is the knowledge of God so important? We can read this in the prayer of Christ just before the crucifixion in John 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Why is the knowledge of God so important? The knowledge of God is so important because that is eternal life. And yes, living in that better place, living in that better world, it's all there because all the world is full of the knowledge of God. And this is our work. Yes, this is your work. This is my work. This is our work that we are to shed to this world. And why is it? What does the knowledge of God do to a person? When I come to understand God in its proper context, and the problem is that so many times people misunderstand the character of God. You listen to the news, and when there's a religious conflict, what happens? People talk about God, and they have a misinformed opinion of who God is. What happens when we have a true knowledge of God? What happens to the individual? We read this in Ministry of Healing on page 425. The knowledge of God as revealed in Christ is the knowledge that all who are saved must have. It is the knowledge that works transformation of character. What does it do? It transforms my character. Do you want to have your character changed? Do you want to have a character changed of the people in this world? then they need the knowledge of God. And we need to have freedom to share that knowledge of God to the world. And we need to have the courage that if we are forbidden to share that knowledge to the world, that we will do like our forefathers did in the early Christian church and still meet from house to house. And to have the courage as our forefathers did in the beginning of the reform movement, and during the time of persecution, the time behind the Iron Curtain, to still meet together as a people. Why? Because that is important, to have a personal connection with each other and to be able to share the knowledge of God. Yes, once again, I thank the Lord for this opportunity to use media 
I've been using media. As soon as I got a chance, I was using media. And I'm a firm believer in media. That's why I've been working so hard to see that we have an online missionary school. And I thank the Lord that some people have taken that to their hearts, both there with Plymouth Leadership College there in California and also in other countries. I know, I think it's in Colombia that they're also using that online media. And I thank the Lord for those opportunities. But it doesn't take the place of personally meeting together with people. And while all this sharing of this information through the stones crying out, as it were, through the media ministry, we want to see God's people, the people that are going to accept the truth, to be changed in their character. Let me read this again. The knowledge of God as revealed in Christ is the knowledge that all who are saved must have. It is the knowledge that works transformation of character. Then this knowledge received will recreate the soul in the image of God. It will impart to the whole being a spiritual power that is divine. What does it do? It recreates the soul in the image of God. We need to have a change in our character. And we can't do it without partaking of the divine nature. And the partaking of the divine nature takes place by a knowledge of God. The true knowledge of the character of Jesus Christ. Not only given by information, but people need to see that character. We have a lot of information. We have a lot of sermons. But that alone doesn't change character People have to see the change of character, and that's why it's important to be able to meet together. You know, there is a better hope. Yes, we have a hope that is not from this world. You know, when we think of people like Enoch, they did not live in a better environment. They did not live in a better society than we do. It says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 38 to 40, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not till the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The second coming of Christ is going to be no different than it was in the time before the flood. And during that time before the flood, what did we have? We had a man by the name of Enoch. And what was Enoch doing? What was he preaching about? What was he talking about to those people? Those people that were in darkness, those people that did not want to have the knowledge of God, just like the time in which we are living in, people don't want to have the knowledge of God. On one hand, you have religious fanaticism. On the other hand, you have religious that don't want to have anything to do with God. And then you have those who are called fanatics because they want to serve God with all their hearts. Well, praise the Lord. We need to be those type of people. Those people that want to serve God with all our hearts. But what was the focus of their message? What was the focus of Enoch? I can tell you the truth that in the time of Enoch, there were probably many conspiracy theories going along as well. And people were studying everything. Just like even when we're studying the book of Revelation. You know, you study the book of Revelation and some people want to focus on the beast and what the beast is doing and what the beast is going to do next and all the horns and everything else. And you know what? We do need to understand those things. But brethren, that's not our focus. The book of Revelation in chapter 1, verse 1, begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes, that's what it's all about. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And Enoch, living be during the time of the flood or before the flood, what was his focus? What was his message? Jude records it in chapter 1. Well, there's only one chapter, verses 14 and 15. I'll just read verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. 
What was his focus? What was it that Enoch was thinking about? What was it that Enoch wanted to understand and share with the people? Yes, we do need to understand some of these things. I love Bible prophecy. I love studying Daniel, all the book of Daniel, even chapter 11 that some people find so difficult. I love studying history, looking at what's happened and what's going to happen. I love the book of Revelation. But the focus of it all is Jesus Christ. And the focus that we need to have today Regardless of which side you're on, and I listen to some of the things, I don't have Facebook, okay? I, I kind of avoid that, but from time to time, I, somebody shares with me something that's on Facebook. And you have those that are in the conspiracy theorist of everything that's going to happen with all this uh, COVID-19. And on the other hand, you have those that believe everything the government has to say. And you know what? We're all losing focus. Our focus is none of these things. Our focus is Jesus Christ. And Enoch was able to focus on the second coming of Christ as they were approaching the time of the flood. You know, when we look at all of our forefathers, what were they thinking about? What was it that was driving them? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 shows us the drive. It says, these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Brethren, do we realize that we're strangers and pilgrims here? Do we realize that, yeah, any one of us could die, whether it's COVID-19 or anything else? You know, when we look at the comparisons that they've been making was of the Spanish flu back in 1918. And I don't want to go into the fact that it was not a real Spanish flu. It was a flu that was going everywhere. I think actually it started up in Kansas or something of that nature. But what were Christians doing during that time? You know, they were ministering to the sick. You know, they were willing to die in order to help other people. You know that they were willing to be there to give them that personal care, not to be isolated somewhere in their dying moments, but ministering to these people at the, at the expense of their own life? Why is it? Because this world was not their home. That's why they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. Are you a stranger and a pilgrim in this world? Are you one looking for another country and willing to make whatever sacrifice is necessary in order to bring the gospel to this world? Are you one of those type of people? You know, Hebrews 11, 15, and 16 describes that country. It says, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. Yes, God has prepared a place for us. Yeah, we can go back to all this stuff anytime we want to. And it seems to me that whenever we're focusing on all the things that are happening here, we want to go back. Well, you can go back. You can turn around and follow whichever side it is on one side, the, the, uh, on either side that we mentioned earlier. Or you can desire a better country. Which one of these are you going to be? You see, in Hebrews 11 verse 10, it says, For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Is that the place you're looking for? Is that the place that we are focusing on? What was it that drove Enoch? What was it that helped him during that time to prepare for all of that crisis? It says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. 
You see, Enoch was looking at the place. And you know, instead of worrying about what's going to happen in this world, what about if we spent that same amount of energy? What happens if we wrote on Facebook, instead of looking at what's the newest thing on all these things, what happens if we started talking about that place that I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for them to love him? What would that do to our characters? What would that do to change you and me? Do we need that type of change? You see, how much time do we spend thinking about that better land? How much time do we really spend thinking about it? In Review on Herald of 1890, it says, those who take no pleasure in thinking and talking of God in this life will not enjoy the life that is to come where God is ever present dwelling among his people. You know, if we're not spending that time talking about heaven, about talking with God, we're not going to enjoy that place. You know, if we're going to talk about all the things that the devil is doing, if we're going to be worried about all the things that he's doing, we're not going to enjoy heaven because we're not going to talk about that there. We're going to talk about the place that we have. We're going to talk about God. Do you want to talk about God? Do you want to think about God? He continues, but those who love to think of God will be in their element, breathing in the atmosphere of heaven. Those who on earth love the thought of heaven will be happy in its holy associations and pleasures. Brethren, this is what we need to be doing. During this time, as we're coming to the end of this week of prayer, do you think it's time for us to refocus, to re-equip ourselves, that the focus of the book of Revelation is actually Jesus Christ, that the focus of the end-time prophecy is Jesus Christ? Why? Because the more you know Jesus, the more you know God, because Jesus is a revelation of God. And the more you have a revelation of God, it will change our character. And knowing God is eternal life because it changes my character fit for heaven. That's why that is so important. You see, when Enoch was thinking only about heaven, yeah, the second coming of Christ and all that stuff, what happened? Hebrews 11, verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I want you to think about this. You see, he was translated, why? Because he pleased God. His character was fit for heaven. And so what will happen when you and I have a taste of the better land, instead of all these other things, when we taste that better land, what will happen? Review on Herald, 1890. Sometimes I think I can stay here no longer. All things of earth look so dreary. I feel very lonely here, for I have seen a better land. When you see the better land, the things in this world, they don't have that same attraction anymore. And you know, when you look at Moses, what happened to Moses on his last day? What happened to him? He went up there to, to stand on Pisgah's peak. And what happened is he had a chance to look at the better land. It says in Manuscript Releases, Volume 10, 159, Mo, as Moses beheld this scene, joy and triumph were expressed in his countenance. He understood the force of all the angels revealed to him. He took in the whole scene as it was presented before him. His mind was firm, his intellect clear, 
His strength was unabated. His eye was undimmed. Then he closed his eyes in death, and the angels of God buried him in the mount, and there he slept. You see, this is the amazing thing. If our mind is there, and if it comes time for me to die, then I'm ready to go. Yes, I am ready to go. You know, I think of my grandfather. I was listening to his story uh, on his last day of life. And you know, he had been ill for quite a length of time. And even for a period of time, he lost his mind. And my aunt Lydia, she took him into her home. And when she started giving him better treatment and everything else than he had in the hospital, that his mind came back six months before he died. And his body was wearing away, but his mind was back. And finally, some things he had struggled with somebody for years, I think for 30 years, that day finally he talked to that individual and he said, look, I'm sorry. He finally apologized. And you know, Brother Devai had come there to visit him. They could speak Hungarian together because my grandfather spent, I think, six months in a Hungarian concentration camp during World War I. And he learned uh, Hungarian there. And so he's able to talk to Brother Devai about the work everywhere else. And you know, my uh, relatives there, my uncle and his, uh, and my aunt, they Heard him that evening before he went to sleep singing songs of the better land. Yes, he was singing those songs of the better land. And then he died. And brethren, what a wonderful way to go. What a wonderful way to go. And what about all of us? It doesn't matter if we die here in this world. You know, some people are so concerned of death. And how many times, you know, we don't even realize how close we are to death. But we should be ready to die. You know, sometimes I've been in airplanes and the airplane starts dropping a thousand meters or so. You know, within a few seconds, I remember the last time I was in Congo, we were flying from Kinshasa to Nairobi and the plane just taking a nosedive. You know, you hear everybody screaming there on the airplane and, and I know this could be it. This is it. And I said, Lord, you know, my first thoughts were of God and of heaven. And all I could think of is, Lord, if it's ready, if, if this is my time, then I want to make sure that everything's right with you. And I began thinking of the heavenly land, you know, in those few seconds as we were going down like that, you know, I said, Lord, you know, but if my work is not done yet, you know, I still got time here. I still got things to do, you know, but if this is it, make sure that I'm ready plane leveled out, everybody calmed down, and you know, I said, I thank you, Lord. I guess I got some more things to do here in this world. I'm not ready to go yet. But you know, if we are thinking of that better land, then we are ready to go just like Moses was. But you know, we have to have a character for the better land. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This is the work that we need to be doing. Yeah, this is the work that we need to be preparing ourselves for. We need to have a character that is fit for heaven. And during this time, this week of prayer, I hope that we've been praying for ourselves as well. Are we actually ready for eternity? Is my character ready for it? You see, Jesus is not going to come again. It's not about how bad the world's going to get. And so many sermons I've heard over the years, oh, the world is, not, is bad, it's getting worse, Jesus is coming again, we know how bad it is. That's not the focus. The focus is that when God's people are ready, he is going to come again. Christ Object Lessons, page 69. It says there, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It's character that we need to be looking at. Your character, my character. And it's not for me to be looking at your character. It's for me 
to be examining my character and saying, Lord, am I ready? And when the character of God's people is ready, immediately he puts in the sickle and he's coming for his own. What about our character? And how does character get changed? How is it possible that my character is fit for Jesus? Christ Object Lessons 312. By Christ's perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. This is why we need to be talking about Christ and the better land. Our focus needs to be there. Yes, I know we need to see what's going on. Don't, don't misunderstand me. When Elijah was there on top of that mountain, Mount Carmel, and those wicked priests were doing their abacadabra and all their voodoo and everything else they could imagine, Elijah was watching them while he was praying. His focus was God. His focus was constantly the truth. But he also kept one eye looking to make sure that they don't light the fire. You know, he, he did that. And so I, I do listen to the news. I do listen to what's happening. But that's not our focus point. You see, when we're looking at Jesus, then what happens? The will is merged to his will. And how does that happen to us? How is it possible for you and I actually to have the character of Christ? It tells us in James chapter 4 and verse 7. It says there, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The whole issue has to deal with submission. Yeah, that, that's what it's all about. It has to deal with the submission of our will to the written will of God. And that's the struggle of Christianity. That's the struggle that we're going through all the time, to surrender my will to God. And the question is, are you taking this time to submit your will to God? Are you ready to do that, to surrender everything to God, to surrender to Him? Everything, our life, our plans, our future, what we have, what we want to have, everything into God's hands. And then praise the Lord for whatever He brings in our pathway. You see, when we look at the faithful in time past, they looked at the future, and that future kept them going. You know, I want to close with Isaiah chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from the all. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. My dear friends, brothers and sisters, whoever is listening to this conclusion of our week of prayer that we have just had, a special week of prayer because of all the things that are happening in this world, what is your focus? You know, in order to focus correctly, we need to look at the work that we have ahead of us. God's people need to meet together. God's people need to be in the homes of each other to be able to give encouragement. People need to see a living Savior, Christ in us, the hope of glory. They need to see that we've been with Jesus. And the way that this happens is that you and I have our focus right. And now, after we complete all of these things, what is your focus? 
Is it time to look at the new heaven and the new earth? So that when we see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory, we're going to be able to say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he has come to save us. May the Lord help us. That not one of us will be missing in that day, but that we'll be all there together. And that we can hear the well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Amen. Let us take this opportunity to pray one more time. Let us bow our knees in prayer. Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you that in spite of all the things that happen in the world, you have given us a glimpse of that better land. Lord, we pray for those who have passed on, who have gone to their rest during this crisis. Help not that their death was in vain. There may be those who can be only touched by the death of one of your children. Bless the death of your saints so they can have a fruit even after they have died. Lord, help us as a church. We think of the work that is going on throughout the world, the means that we need to send out missionaries, the means that we need to support missionaries in other fields, the means that we need even in this building that we're recording these meetings in, that it may be completed so we can do the work. Lord, we're trusting in you. And during this time of prayer, Lord, help us that you may accomplish these things. We don't know how it's going to be done, but we know you're going to do it. Help your people to focus on Jesus Christ so that we can be among that number that when Jesus comes again the second time that we can say, Lord, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has come to save us. Lord, help these borders that are closed right now that they may somehow open so that we can go from place to place and share this message. Be with your people, Lord, so that we can be prepared to go places that we have not gone yet. Places that we have looked at and for whatever reasons have not entered. So many countries in this world are in darkness and we're comfortable in places where we have many members. Lord, help us to have that spirit of evangelism that we may leave our comfort zones and go and evangelize the world and see Jesus come again the second time so that we can spend eternity, not in this world, but in the world that you have prepared for us. Answer our prayers, Lord, during this week of prayer. The many unspoken requests, those that people are praying right now in their hearts, answer them to your honor and glory. Not always in the way we want it, but to your honor and glory. Help us to be a people prepared for your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen.